you, you have to be tough to be a manager in the first place. It's a lonely job and it's a tough job. Some people can do it and some people can't. Sport. Another manager has departed the Premier League today. Swansea City have let their manager, Gary Monk, go. They've been in poor form in the Premier League with just one win in their last 11 top flight games. Jenkins took over at Bramwell Lane in June last year on a three year contract but has been relieved of his duties after just one season. United have parted company with Alan Stubbs. The Millers are currently bottom of the Championship. Tom Feeney has more. The Millers are looking for their fifth manager in the space of just 14 months. Talk about earning your stripes and, and, and the 10,000 hours and whatever mm. profession you do, that's what makes you an expert or a professional. Uh, I retired early at 30. Uh, devastating for, for someone of limited ability that, if you like, was living the dream and, and had a passion and enthusiasm to play and train the best he could at everything he could do. Uh, so to have it taken away at 30, uh, was, was a shock. So it's difficult, but I don't think there's any one defining moment that made me tougher or more resilient or anything like that. I think it's a culmination of things and you go along and you go along. That's what you do for a living. It's your job. But it's not like a job really, it's, it's a way of life. You know, I've always been a captain and a leader um, and I think that you know, the, the, it's a natural transition to, to then go and be a manager, you know, be a leader as a manager. I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, my, my initial um, stint in management was, was sort of a baptism of fire. You know, I went to Halifax as, um, as player coach. Paul Bracewell brought me in as player coach. Um, and he wasn't in the job long. I, w I was there till the end of the season, and that season we stayed up, and then he sort of, with this, the results didn't go well at the beginning, and he, and he, and he resigned. And, and I got thrown in as caretaker manager, but I was still playing. But what I quickly learned is that it's it's difficult to be a manager and a player as well. You know what it does is it, it, it dilutes both. You know it's it's near on impossible really. But you do pick up. You know you, you start learning the, the the bits and the tools that you need to be you know to be a manager from that point on. If if you're strong and you're mentally strong and you can and you can utilise that you know that period of time, it can really benefit you. I could have just you know carried on my career and, and not really thought about it because. Players don't really, to be fair, they don't think about the future and uh, it always takes something drastic to then decide what, what we're going to do outside of football if, if you can't have your career. And that was the time about, about age 26 when I decided to take all my badges and, and do that while I was out injured and then I got a nice feel for it and I, I quite fancied having a go at it, so mm. that was how it started. From Leeds I went to Carlisle's assistant, loved the coach, he loved the role, um, the manager got sacked and I took over on a caretaker basis, did well. Probably a bit unlucky not to get the job first time round, but wanted it as well then. Um, and then the second time when some, John Ward was appointed, he left after a bad run and I had another good caretaker spell, got the job and really enjoyed it. Um, and then you see a different side to football, Danny. It's really not as easy as, you, as it looks, as what people might think it is. And the pressure that you, you, you have heaped on you from all different angles is immense. During the week, I'm very intense. I'm a systems and process type guy, structure, organisation, mm -hmm. uh, but that's Monday to Friday. By Saturday I'm actually quite relaxed and calm in comparison to my normal persona. <laughs> As a manager on the side, uh, you try to create a persona of calmness. You know, don't let emotion affect your decisions because you're judged on decisions that you make. Mm. And it's tough because you're in a chimp's fighting against you because your personality. So what made me successful or, or made me cope as a player, you're fighting as a manager because what you don't want to do, you don't want to transmit that to the players. Knowing that you've done your work through the week is, is a good feeling because you know, you know you're going to go into that arena then having the best chance. Um, you know, and match days, to be honest with you, it, it, it becomes about the players and facilitating the players and it becomes about you know, them, it's reinforcing the game plan, you know, giving them confidence, giving them belief. You know, the responsibility is, is with that 11. As soon as you cross that white line at three o'clock, you know, it's, it's down to them. I think when it comes round to match days, you know, all your preparations more or less done, the players report, they'll go out, have the warm up and one thing and another, you'll have an odd word about this and that and the other. Once you get the team sheet, their team, because you try and predict what the team's going to be, you know for sure at two o'clock. So they don't need too much distraction now. That's the most difficult time for the manager. That's the longest, I always find that was the longest time. You know, when the players go out to the dressing room to warm up, you're left there. 
and with your own thoughts and things like that. So maybe sit down, read a program, try and do something. <clears throat> Some revert to the whiskey bottle. I never managed, I never got round to that. I maybe did after it, but not before it. It's just like praying for a win. How am I going to beat this team who have got a lot more resources than me? I'm on paper a man for man better than me. And you have to try and find a way of appeasing your supporters. So I used to start praying, I think, and really thinking long and hard and hoping that we could just do ourselves proud, you know, week in, week out. And more often than not, we did. You know, we didn't win every game, and um, but we, 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 we certainly put on a good fist and gave it everything we'd got, you know. But um, as in terms of superstition, superstition for me in football is how hard you work. You know, it's just it's how hard you work, then you get lucky. If you give them too much information at half time, it's difficult. You've got to remember these guys are coming in, um, and they're in the heat of the battle. Their adrenaline's high, you know, and, and, and you know there's going to be discussions anyway in the dressing room. Um, but I think if you can give them three major things, you know, that can affect the game, affect the second half, um, and again just go over the good points, you know, because any sport's about confidence. You know, the last thing you want to be doing is having a post-mortem at half-time because they've got to go back out again, you know, for the next 45 minutes and, and either try and put it right or, or, you know, stay in front. So it's important that it's, it's a confident, positive message. Make it as simple and as clear as possible to help them do better. Mm. So try not to give more than three basic, simple instructions. And, and again, it, it's very important that the message doesn't get lost in the words. Uh, leave them for five minutes don't speak, you know, uh, and stating the obvious or, or not being happy with them. Again, human nature, how they act and react. If you, if you were going into a press conference uh, and, uh, and, you, and you're on a good run, a winning run, then it's quite, it's quite straightforward. Mm. If it's indifferent, then, you know, they'll ask you questions and you have to, have to try and answer them because it's going out all over the place. And you're duty bound now, you know, as a manager, you've got to go on the telly, you've got to go on the radio. If you're having a bad time and they're after you, you know, which they can be because people, people say they don't like change. Well, football isn't like that. They do like change in football. If you got beat and, and, the, and the side's not on a good run, then you're going to have someone that's got an agenda. You know that. Um, and likewise, if you're winning, you know, they try and get out of your things, you know, that you're going to get promoted or, you, you know, so there's, there's always an angle. But I think that if you go in with an honest appraisal um, of how the team's performed, and, and it's always been my case, you know, definitely at Leeds, if, if they'd not played well, I just said they didn't play well. You know, and I see a lot of managers, particularly old, older managers, that sort of try and pull the wool over during this size and, you know, bang on about a penalty that should have been had when the fact they've just got beat 3-0 at home. You know, it's, it, it just it doesn't make sense, you know, you, you're insulting people's intelligence. Um, so, if you, if, you know, if you've played well, you tell people you've played well, you know, and sometimes you can get beat and play well, you know, and you've got to be consistent, you know, with what you say, but um, I think honesty is the best policy. Tough. Uh, you know, it, it's something that when you go from coaching to managing, uh, it's a demand on your time and energy. You have your press conference before the game. If you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, you're speaking to them three times a week. You know, some people don't speak to their wives three times a week. <laughs> and, and you find yourself speaking to people who are prompting and provoking. That's, that's the job. I think the key factor is, is understand it's not personal. Mm -hmm. It's tough at times, especially when things aren't going well. You know, the, the, the game for me consumes us or absorbs us, depending if you're doing well or not. Uh, and, and the press is a, a necessary evil to a degree. But more often than not, the difficult questions are ones you ask yourself. Uh, so therefore, uh, be as honest as you can be and as fair as you can be, because it's not always possible as a manager. But we're not there forever. <clears throat> And there's a well-known old saying in the game, like the day you get a job is the day nearer losing it. It's not different, you have to get results. I think maybe now they're a little bit more impatient. Mm. And technology's moved on so much that everybody's an expert now, mm. and they all have an opinion, which they're entitled to. But unfortunately now it can be voiced all over the place in media. and So it's a, it's a little more difficult now, I would have thought. From, from a novice manager looking to progress, you know, I'd love time, and it's, it's, it, to, to, as you say, establish what you are, have the team reflect what you are and what the club is, but more importantly, when you go into a club, define the rules, you know, what's the goals, you know, what, what do they want to achieve, 
And I think if you do that at a club and, and you agree the goal, uh, along with what you've got uh, in terms of resources, and people automatically assume that's budget. And uh, maybe being Scottish and being rather tight with money is a... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't agree with that. Because mm. whatever you've got, if you spend it well, because you've got system and process, and particularly in your recruitment, or you bring in the right characters because your due diligence has been correct, then you've got a chance of being successful. And also the biggest resource you have at a club is people, mm. including fans. So it's important that you unite them, engage them, bring them together and, and maximise what you have because that's, that'll give you a degree of success. But that takes time. And, and, and the society at the moment and football at the moment is suggesting that we don't have that. So it is tough because do you want to assemble a team or build a club? I don't want to do it again. Um, I feel that 75 to 80% of chairmen and owners and people making really big decisions on managers' careers and livelihoods don't know enough about the game, don't know enough, make bad decisions, employ and get the wrong person in place time after time after at the time and remain there. You know, managers get four, four defeats wrong, get sacked. Chairman employ six or seven different managers and stay in place. Well, they own the clubs, I suppose, so they have that right, but there needs to be a bit more care on selection of manager to give the managers a fighting chance because it is their livelihoods. And certainly for me, I can't put my hands in, 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 in the way of people that I don't think really do understand what the game is all about. You know, when I first made my debut as a 17 year old for Bolton, it was unheard of the manager getting sacked, you know, and, and, and managers got teams relegated and it just, they just didn't get the sack. It just didn't happen. Um, but, you know, in modern day football now, if, if you lose three or four games on the trot and your team's in, in a poor position, you're out. Simple as that. But but the thing is, is that there's, there's an irony here that, you know, history says that the sides that are successful, that get promoted, are the ones that build and, and have two or three years at it and have that consistency um, to get promoted. So there's there's got to be a fine line and a balance there. And, you know, it's got to be something that the owners understand. I think what is important is not so much how your manager deals with the, the pressure, it's how your owner deals with the pressure. You know, can your owner deal with the pressure? Because what usually happens if, if your manager's getting it, then, you know, they'll, they'll by and large, they'll wear it a little bit. But if they turn on the owners, you know, it's usually a good night for the manager. I know there's a lot of old players out there that says, you know, it's, it's not as good as when I played and players were better and, you know, the, the, the game was better and there's a better feel. But, you know, I, I just think that's rubbish. Everybody in the world turned against me and that's what it feels like. You can't get a high like when you win on Saturday at a quarter to ten to five. I mean, the thing is, is, you know, I've always been tough as regards, you know, mentally tough. Um, you know, I've had tough, tough times as, as a player, you know, and... Um, but I've always had the belief and confidence in what I were doing as a player. Um, now, as a manager, exactly the same. You know, there's going to be, and I look at it like this. You know, what played over a thousand games, fifth in the all-time player. There's, there's, there's going to be not many people out there with the, with the knowledge of the game or, or the experience of actually being in the middle of it than me. You know, and, and I always back myself with that. Um, you know, it, it seems quite conceited to say, and I'm, I'm not. But you know, it, it gives you confidence to know that you've had these experiences, um, and you know that you know football's not an exact science, and you, you, you can lose games. You know, you can, as, as as much as you can win games. Um, but it's it's using that experience and using that knowledge to make yourself better. I think that is the most important thing. Everybody in the world turned against me, and that's what it feels like. They didn't, but it feels like that. It feels like a really lonely place. It feels like you're a lonely person, and you can share it with close people, your own kids, your family, your close friends, your teammates, your staff. But do you know what? It's, it's, it's not nice. It really is the worst thing that's ever happened to me in football, is the criticism and the, and the, um, the impatience and unrealistic dreams of some of the supporters and I, and I think do you know what there's a lot of managers who would, would would say exactly the same but can't because you, they need different I'm not going to be a manager again I've made my mind up because of a lot of different reasons nothing to do with the fans I can cope with the fans mm -hmm. they just want success and you I, I understand that and sometimes they think they can pick the right team they think they know the tactics they probably don't they probably don't 38 years I've been in the game I think that qualifies me to probably be just ahead of them but you respect them but you know, when you're getting battered from the press and, and battered from the fans and, and you know that 
the jobs become almost. I mean, the day I got beat here with Naki Wells and Hanson, and they just got promotion, and the side was flying. We had four 17-year-olds playing. We, we were the, they were the stronger side, mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to find a way of winning. We did more often than not, um, but that's really the the worst time of my football career. Mm -hmm. It was very very difficult to deal with, and, and getting a, you know some abuse that you get, and your daughter's there and your mum's there. My lads could cope with it, my daughter couldn't, my mum certainly couldn't, 72. Uh, and I'm not sure that's fair on what I consider a lot of great people that are managers, great guys. And I can name you quite a few names that would say the same things, but it, you know they're still in the game and still trying to fight that, that situation. I don't think it's right. Managing at Leeds is obviously, as a kid, I was a Leeds supporter. Um, you know, and I think there were one time, I think we played Derby at home, it was a Derby game at home. And it was a packed house, you know, and we ended up, we, we went on to win the game 2 0, and it was a cracking game because Derby were bang at the top of the league. And just before the kickoff started, I, I actually turned around and looked to the place where I used to sit with my dad in the West Stand. And it was like quite a surreal moment, really. You know, it was sort of a dawning, you know, the fact that that's where I was as a, you know, seven, eight year old boy, you know, with his father sort of being taught the trade, you know, looking at this Don Revy side that were, you know, beating everybody in front of him. And all of a sudden, there I am, you know, managing the team. Well, I'd been to Wembley the year before, Dan, and got beat 4-1 by a Southampton team that contained half the team that's in the Premiership now, or certainly the, the players are all playing in the Premiership now. And they were miles better than us. You know, there was um, 73,000, it's a dream, 73,000 people, and I'm in charge of one of the sides that's competing in that match. But we got beat quite easily, and it, it hurt like you would not believe. Getting there was great, the day was great, but as soon as the first goal went in, it really kicked in how tough football is and we didn't get too many pats on the back. Did from the chairman, we made 1.3 million quid. So I got a massive pat on the back for the chairman, but the fans who, who went down there in numbers, uh, seen us get beat, you know, by a better team. Simple as that, you know, nothing to do with selection or tactics. They were a better team, but mm. most people don't accept that. I'm being brutally honest, they were better than us. And if I'd read you the two lineups out, you'd see that. But the next year going back and winning, again, against a team with a bigger budget, more resources, probably better players, was fantastic because I said to the chairman, I'll put this right. I actually told my family, my children, that we'd, and, but they're grown up now, they're not. But they were hurt because they knew how hurt I was. And to go back there and win and see the faces and the elation and take the cup on the Sunday to a pub, to a pub, Danny, and all the local people in the little village I lived in in Weatherby drink out of it and, and, and cheer us on was the, my way of celebrating proper down to earth people who, who had supported me through a lot of hard times but it wasn't until the referee blew the whistle and I was actually in the dressing room and champagne corks were hitting me on top of the head like a bottle of beer really but anyway I sucked a bit of champagne. You can't get a high like when you win on Saturday at a quarter to ten to five mm. you've prepared all week for the game and you win that's a fantastic feeling uh, conversely to that you know when you lose it's it's a real bad low you know but the highs and lows are like extremes really mm. you don't get too carried away with it because there's another game round the corner. Mm. So that's how it is. I know there's a lot of old players out there that says, you know, it's not as good as when I played and players were better and, you know, the, the, the game was better and there's a better field. You know, I, I just think that's rubbish. I think the game gets better. You know, I think it's, it's quicker, the fitter, the more tactically aware, um, you know, players are more athletic. It's just, I just think everything gets better. Um, but I still think that, you know, great players um, that were then would be great players now. They're probably even better now because they'd understand the diet, they'd understand about their own bodies, um, you know, they'd, they'd understand the game better because training's got better, you know, the knowledge of the game and, you know, now players move teams about the pitch. Um, things have just got better and, um, you know, for me, you know, as regards the game developing, it's, it's, it's developing, you know, past expectations. It, it changes like fashion mm. and, and it's what's the in thing at the moment and the in thing is is possession, possession football and you know and it's very rare now that you see teams who who, who really score goals from, from crosses, it's mm. very rare, um, it's old fashioned, seen as being old fashioned, well actually it's probably the most effective way to score a goal, crossing the ball. That's a very frustrating uh, thing to see from me because that means they've only got one plan and they're not prepared to change. And sometimes you have to change, uh, even within a game. And if you haven't got plan A working, you've got to try and go with plan B, even plan C. Look at England. 
they had they, in the in recent times the teams now just defend so deeply. If you got if you want possession, you know that you have it. But mm. actually, what you're doing with it is is the most important thing. Mm. And if you're not doing the, the right things in the right areas, i.e. the penalty box, it doesn't matter how much um, possession you have. You can have 90%. It doesn't mean to say that you you're going to win the game. The people who are teaching them aren't. Uh, on the best, really. This play in the right way. Mm. Well, what's the right way to play? The right way to play is you devise a system of play that suits the players you have available to you. Mm. If everybody plays the same way and everybody goes to Lillisall or where St George's, wherever it is, and everybody teaches everybody the same thing, these school teachers who have become coaches, no wrong with that, but I go back to being a physio. Mm. Be a school teacher, be a school teacher. Mm. It'll go a complete circle. Once upon a time, people used to wear flare bottom trousers. Mm. Then they became drain pipes. Then they become parallels. Mm. Then you had three button jackets. Then you had two buttons. Then you had kipper ties. Then you had slim ties. Then you had cutaway collars. Then you had, if you, if you lived to be 100, you'd see you go complete cycle. That's what mm. will happen to football. But you've got to cross the ball. If you don't cross the ball, you don't score goals. Mm. And mm. it also, what it'll do, it'll drive people away from the game. Mm. They won't come and see it. It's like watching paint dry, some of it. Be strong with with what you believe in, you know, and um, uh, you know, and, and, and use your time wisely, you know, to to, to research things and um, and to understand, you know, how to better yourself. You know, never stop learning. I think that is the most important thing. I think if if you've got an open mind um, and you're not frightened to ch you know to change, be strong in your beliefs. But if you're not frightened to change and you can adapt and adjust. By and large, if you know you've got a chance of being successful, but I think an open mind is is really important. You, you never stop learning. You know, I don't think you ever stop learning in this game, and I, and I think that the moment that you stop learning, I think you're finished. Well, first and foremost, in, enjoy because I think your first three years is going to be your key. Um, if you if you can have some minor success, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to win promotion for promotion, but if you can have some success. And, it, it, and that's been quantified by whatever club you're at. Whatever that is, and that, that's what their, their goals are, and you manage to do that. And if you can do that in your first three years, then you start to become an established manager. It's very difficult to get established. And if you haven't done it in that first three years, it's very rare that you'll go beyond that. Be your own man. Be your own man. Yeah, I think so. Keep that like that and listen. And when you have to say something, make sure they get the message of what you want and just build the club the way you want to build it. Mm. You must have a relationship with your chairman now, a good relationship with your chairman. That's like vitally important. And if you're a, a, a young manager coming in, <clears throat> depending on what level you're coming in at, then perhaps a little bit of experience might help you, someone. <clears throat> Not that I'm taking for a job because I've got a one, but maybe it's a consideration. And most of all, enjoy it. Enjoy it, if you can. Get your, the, your own staff around you, the staff that you really think are the right people. Trust, trust what you believe in and go out and do things your way. Don't listen to outside influence, whether it be the chairman, the press, the supporters. Do things your way. And if you're going to go down, do it doing what you've, been, you've created and you've built up of knowledge over the years that you've been in the game. And then you can have no, no, no qualms about it. I've got no qualms about it. I did it my way. It was reasonably, relatively successful. And if you look at the figures and the facts, it's probably more successful than I'll give myself credit for.